Good afternoon from here in Denmark and welcome to the GWO webinar. My name is Julie Brown and I'll be presenting the GWO Enhanced First Aid Review. We also have Thomas Grunland here who will be presenting the GWO Sea Survival. Do you want to say hi Thomas? Yes, thank you, Julie, for the presentation. Sorry, I was muted. It never happened to me before, uh, but it's good to be here. Thank you. Okay, so on to the agenda for the session. Thomas, if you could move on to the next slide for me. Thank you. So the agenda will be an introduction and updates to the GWO Enhanced First Aid, introduction and updates to the GWO Sea Survival, We'll then be answering any questions you've submitted through the link over the past three weeks. So as you may be aware, the Enhanced First Aid Review um, updated standards was released on the 1st of October this year, and that will be version four. So why have we reviewed the standard? Due to the changes, in the GWA first aid module, we received a request from our training committee to review the enhanced first aid training standard to ensure that all markets have a first aid qualification relevant to their country needs. In addition, the working group managing the project felt it was a great opportunity to further align the flow of the standard. To ensure we meet requirements, of many countries, including the HSC requirements for the UK, we've added a syllabus to the syllabus, therefore the duration has changed. The enhanced first aid is still a three day duration. However, the enhanced first aid standard has now increased in time to 21 hours 30. The refresher is now 14 hours. However, we must make it clear it is still a two days duration. So the updated Enhanced First Aid and Enhanced First Aid Refresher modules, as we've just explained, do now uh, meet all the country requirements. The working group took the opportunity to align the topics for a better flow and ensuring a clearer sequence. As in all reviews, we've gathered and analyze relevant risk assessments from the working group companies. And in addition, as always, reviewed the latest G plus report for 2021. So onto the detailed changes we've made. Version three has now been replaced by version four. The instructor requirement sessions now better express the appropriate qualifications and experience needed to teach the standard. The risks, hazards and legislation have now been added to, taking account of the G20, G plus 21 report and the updated legislation. As already mentioned, we've improved the flow of the lessons and the duration as already discussed has now increased. However, again, I would like to emphasize that it still stays within the three day duration for the standard and the two days for the refresher. The specific main changes for lesson three and four are within the lesson three, we have a title change to anatomy and physiology. Serious injuries were moved to lesson five as separate elements. Lesson four now includes further criteria on teleconsultation and a number of learning objectives have also been moved uh, and they will be covered within lesson seven. Within lesson five, the learning objectives were revisited and updated to ensure we have a flow and we meet country specification. Catastrophic bleeding has been updated. Equipment within learning objective 41 was updated and the primary and secondary survey has been revisited as 
has the CPR and that's been updated as well. We also have further changes to lesson five. Elements have been added focusing on bite wounds and eye injuries. Significant illness has also been added to with a focus on anaphylactic shock, asthma, epilepsy and seizures, heart attack, stroke, diabetes and motion sickness. We've had changes to lesson seven. Lesson seven is now focused specifically on scenario-based training. We've included a recommendation of the importance of participants undertaking a general warm-up before taking part in scenarios. And examples of the scenarios were also updated and rearranged to provide a more logical and relevant list of scenario examples. We've also updated the annex within the standard. The equipment list has been updated and added to. The main addition is the inclusion of medical oxygen therapy, equipment including high concentration breathing masks. So before handing over to Thomas, I'd like to thank the working group who gave their time and specialist knowledge to ensure we have a high quality, comprehensive first aid training. Siemens Gamesa, Equinor, Vestas, Hotter, and Reliant Newtech. I'd like to now hand over to Thomas, who will present the Sea Survival Review. Thank you, Julie. And here we go. So my plan is to present the, the most uh, special or the biggest changes to the standard. In all the, in all the standards, we have the, the uh, change logs where you can see all details on what has been changed. But I'll go through with the most special ones. And uh, we are, there are some questions afterwards that uh, may also unfold some of these uh, topics. So just uh, an introduction side to say, yeah, I'm Thomas. I put on this ex-mask navigator and ex-Navy commander from, from the Navy just to say that for the last four, 46 years of my uh, uh, life, I've done a lot of sea survival exercises and trainings in different scenarios. So and this is just to say that I'm a sailor. I'm a sailor guy. And uh, I'm also a master of education. So I'm also a learning guy. I'm not a wind guy, but uh, I think sea survival is inside my field. Um, here we go. Why did we uh, review the practical exercises on the sea survival module? It's a fair question uh, because we found out that there were a lot of uh, unnecessary accidents that happened during training. And uh, as most of you maybe have noticed, there was just uh, around New Year, there was uh, an injury from jumping from four meters. And, and uh, we started discussing why is this actually necessary? And then we found out there's a good reason to go through all the practical exercises in the sea survival to risk analyze it and uh, make a training need analysis on uh, all the exercises. So that's why we do it, because uh, we need the trainings to be safe. We have uh, put an extra emphasis on, on uh, transfer, transfer between CTVs and, and wind turbines, because transfer between those, th those uh, places are one of the major uh, assets are off in offshore uh, industry. And just to say, to say to put a, a few words on the new practical exercises for sea survival, instead of jumping into the water, we have made a, designed a new exercise where the participants should uh, crawl down, descend by the ladder of the TP and release the, the uh, life vest, inflate the life vest, uh, set off into the water and practice individual and collective swimming and finishing that exercise by entering the life raft. All these activities will of course be demonstrated by the instructor and the instructor will also demonstrate how to, how to walk into the water holding uh, the life vests uh, 
but we're not supposed to jump into the water. And this is really neat analysis that says, what is the most uh, possible situation for why should the wind worker uh, go into the water? And that is because if they have to leave the wind turbine, uh, there are not many accidents at sea uh, by CTVs sinking. So um, this is why we've designed this exercise. We also designed this uh, double evacuation detachment in the water. Uh, it's a part of double evacuation and descending is a part of the working at height training, but to, to release in the water is uh, actually quite difficult, as we can see on uh, these small videos. It, uh, there are some challenges, challenges in that, and why not train it at a training center so they know what to do, how to do it in case something should happen and they have to leave the wind turbine. Back to the transfer. We have uh, designed the, the transfer exercise into two phases. The first phase where they, in a dry training, uh, practice the actual procedures. And even though there are different procedures, uh, there are procedures in all wind farms and these, these procedures must be must be uh, practiced. So um, the instructor says advance and the uh, participant advance and do what they have to do. And when they have practiced that for a few times, then they go out into the, the pool or wherever they go, and then they practice it with actually climbing up a real ladder. We have had some discussions on twin fall arrest lanyards, but they're still a part of the syllabus because uh, the twin followers lanyards may be the solution if a uh, self-retractable lifeline is not available. There's also a new, a new uh, pre prerequisite for uh, having the working and height uh, certification before participating in a the sea survival training. And that is because uh, there is a lot of uh, working a height skills uh, they use, they apply on the sea survival also. And also for the instructor to be, be, um, be certified as a working at height, uh, not instructor, but to, just to have a hold, uh, hold a um, working at height certificate. There are accidents because the instructors may not actually, the sea survival instructors may not actually be very observant on what's happening on the working and height perspectives during the sea survival. So now we say um, they have to have this working and height mindset. So these were the, were the main changes to the sea survival. And uh, we've received a few questions, and uh, Julie and I will, will do our best now to, to answer these. Thank you, you ready, Thomas. Julie? Yeah, I've got a few questions for you. So the first question, Thomas, when does the version 16 come into force? Uh, the version 16 is the one that we uh, released 1st of October this year, and uh, there's a, a six six uh, months grace period. So uh, 1st of April next year, we have to, to um, yeah, then it's in force. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, so on to the next question. Mm -hmm. Can't anyone attend the GWO Sea Survival course without the GWO Working at Heights <coughs> Training Certificate? No, uh, as I addressed in, in my presentation, there is, uh, there is a lot of, of working and height skills to be applied during the sea survival, and uh, including the use of a self-retractable -retractab lifeline and twin, twin fall arrest lanyards. So, and the participants, they have to be familiar with these assets, uh, partly be, be, to be able to apply them safely and competent during the training, and partly because the instructor, so he doesn't have to spend uh, extra time training time to introduce the participants and, and to teach them how to use the working height assets. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Okay, question number three. What about customers that only need the sea survival certificate? Do they need to obtain working at heights? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a, it's a good it's a good question. So first first of all, to do a, to do a sea survival training, uh, every participant must hold the valid working and height certificate, as I just uh, introduced before. But secondly, in, on 1st of October this year, GWO released a one-day wind limited access training aiming at people who should just visit a wind turbine once or twice and where, where a whole BST package would be too much and, and maybe not needed. So to make this one-day training sufficient for visiting wind turbine, uh, there will be a demand of two experienced wind technicians to accompany the visitors. So the answer to the question is, Yes, they must, uh, they must obtain a, win, a working and height certificate before joining a sea survival training, but there are other ways also. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, so we have three more questions for you. Next one. Why was the exercise on writing the capsized life raft taken out of the training? Yeah, <clears throat> well, the work group analyzed the exercise uh, to, to be to some extent risky because you risk to get a head trauma at the life raft and the compressed air bottle uh, hits you when you're turning around. <clears throat> um, and, and you may get in, entangled with, with safety lines and entry equipment or other stuff around the life raft when you're letting yourself out from under the raft. And the training need analysis showed us that uh, because the ability of, the, of lightning and life raft uh, is under the STCW training for mariners, and it's not for wind technicians for traveling just to and from work on a CTV. So we decided there's no need to take the slightest risk to learn this. But to make sure that C CTV passengers are aware of the possibility to ride in a cash size life raft, it is in the standard for the instructor to demonstrate how this can be done and if from examples from, from the Estonia uh, ship uh, loss in, in the, the Baltic in the 90s, where most of the passengers died because, partly because some of the life rafts were actually upside down and nobody thought about how can we, how can we turn them over. So we think it's, it's, it's good to know that it's possible to turn them over, but we don't, uh, we analyzed that it was not necessary to, to actually train it. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, so on to the next question. Is the summary exercise in sea survival training mandatory or not? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I think we, we haven't wrote, written that totally clear. I thought we had, but, but we will make it totally clear. The exercise is not mandatory anymore. Uh, the standard says that if time permits and the local training risk analyzes and the safety precautions are sufficient, then the summary exercise may be conducted. Uh, there is for sure an extra learning experience in the exercise when you train in a more real, uh, real environment. And most of the interviewed participants that uh, the participants that we interviewed during the pilot uh, this summer, uh, they found that the exercise uh, with waves and wind and sometimes dark and lightning and stuff, it was both uh, inspiring, but they also found it was it was a good learning to do it in a more real environment. And nevertheless, the exercise is not mandatory also because we consider it, uh, that, well, we consider that the minimum viable learning objectives, they are met in the described practical exercises in the standard. Uh, and also because the, the, the not mandatory summary exercise, it calls for extra resources that not all training providers can actually provide. Thank you, Thomas. So I've got a final question for you. Ten, mm -hmm. ten bonus points, Thomas, if you uh, if you can answer that. Um, could some of the more significant changes have been flagged earlier? Working at heights is a prereq to sea survival. This is a good example due to the sizable impact. Yeah, this is this is a tricky one. We 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 often discuss in the training team, as as you also know, Julie, that. Now, when, should, when should we start tell the world that we are moving in a direction? Can we do it before the changes are actually approved by the training committee? Uh, and this is an ongoing discussion we have, and we haven't landed on, on uh, which way to go. But um, on this, this visual about, about the working in height as a pre-rig, uh, the main part of the work group 
they were in experienced training providers and both the members and then the training providers in the work group agreed that uh, we all agreed on these prerequisite uh, uh, changes in the standard, including the working and height requirement. And yes, this prerequisite, it does call for a certain uh, schedule of delivering for the BST package so that you have to do the working and height before you do, do the sea survival. Uh, uh, but yes, it does. We also checked in winter that that is less than 15% of the sea survival participants that do not hold a working and height certificate. Uh, so maybe the problem is not so big. Also, as I introduced before, the uh, the wind limited access one day training it may may help if, if there are any problems about this uh, prerequisite for the sea survival. Thank you, Thomas. That's all the sea survival questions. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have some questions for you, Julie. Okay, let me do my best. Ah, I know, I know. So the first one uh, is, is about what first aid course can do what. If I'm a wind technician, which of the first aid courses does actually meet my needs? Well, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a question we're getting uh, quite often. Uh, what we would say is that the first aid requirements that do vary regionally, and the requirements for your region are determined by your local legislation, um, which the manufacturer or operator is obliged to follow. So the two-day first aid module of basic training will no longer be available for uh, as a global standard, as you know, from April 2023. So if your country or your regional legislation requires a first aid training of longer than one day duration, training providers are advised to pursue certification in the GWO enhanced first aid standard. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, my next question is uh, of the, the two day first, first aid module. For how long can I offer this two day first aid module? Okay, thank you. So the two day first aid module will now expire on the 1st of April 2023 and be replaced with the GWO one day first aid module. However, if this does not meet the country requirements, as we've just mentioned, GWO do suggest that the GWO enhanced first aid standard is used. Okay, right. thank you. Uh, isn't is there or isn't there a prerequisite for, uh, for the GWO enhanced first aid standard? Okay, thanks, Thomas. So there, there was, there no longer is a prerequisite now for the participant to complete the GWO first aid module prior to the enhanced first aid. Okay. And what is the difference then between enhanced first aid and the first aid BST module? So the enhanced first aid is an extension, as you know, of the GWA first aid training. The enhanced first aid is targeted towards personnel who are selected by their employer to perform the enhanced first aid onshore and offshore. Whereas GWA first aid module is focused on the basic training um, and providing life-saving first aid until the casualty can be handed over to the next level of care. The enhanced first aid therefore covers in further detail ABCDE principle, telemedical assistance and includes the full, uh, a full day of scenario-based activity. Okay, thank you for that. Next question. If, if a new participant books a first aid training, is it still possible to combine this training with the enhanced first aid training or does he have to follow these trainings separately? Okay, so the training should be completely completed separately. However, if the participant, as I said, has attended the EFA course, they will now gain the EFA and first aid winder certification. So they'll gain two certifications for uh, attending the enhanced first aid course. Okay, and then, then follows a, a, a tricky one, I think, uh, if, if on the enhanced first aid refresher. If a participant is following the enhanced first aid refresher, does he have to have his first aid as a prerequisite for that? No, he doesn't. So a participant must have completed the enhanced first aid 
all the enhanced first aid training uh, within the validation period of 24 months. Okay. And my last question, Julie, uh, is about all of it. So if, if I read the standard carefully, then I assume the enhanced first aid and the enhanced first aid refresher, they can be followed without a valid first aid certificate. Is this the right conclusion? That's absolutely correct. Oh. Thank you Thank for you. your answers. You're welcome. So um, for any further questions, please contact the info, info at globalwindsafety.org and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Don't forget to join the Wind Limited Access Standard Webinar on the 1st of December. And we would like to thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. Bye. Bye.